Matthew tells us that when John asked if Jesus was the one to come, Jesus responded by saying, look around you. Our call this Advent journey is to look around us, to see the one who comes already at work among us, and to celebrate that presence with joy. We light the candles of peace and hope and joy to light our way as we journey. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, that God may teach us the ways of peace and hope and joy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us stand and sing together hymn number 218, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Would you stand, please? We invite our children to come forward now for our children's time. Children, come on down and meet me right up here in the front. Good morning. Come on down. Good morning, everybody. So good to see you all. Let's have a seat right here. How about that? Good morning. What a very strange thing with this morning. I'm going to put it on my head and see if you can tell me what this is. Does anybody know what this is? What is it? It's a headlamp. When do you need a headlamp? At night. At night. Excellent. Because a headlamp does what? It lights the path. 
it lights the path for you. Oh my gosh, that's just, that's a children's sermon right there. It lights the path for you in the dark. And so I brought my headlamp today. What do you think about the strobe light, right? Isn't that crazy? That's a crazy thing. Yeah, we don't like that. Everybody's like, take that thing off, Pastor Betsy. So I brought a headlamp today because we are talking about a man named John the Baptist. Now first, I want to assure everybody in the Methodist house that John the Baptist was not really a Baptist, okay? <laughs> no. John the Baptist was a baptizer, and so we call him John the Baptizer when you walk through the Methodist door. But John the Baptizer came along about the same time that baby Jesus came along. Did you know that John and Jesus were cousins? Isn't that cool? And John had one thing that he was told by God that he was to do all of his life, and that was to act like a light that shone on Jesus' life. And so all of his life, it was like he was a headlamp. He shone his light on Jesus. And a lot of people listened to John, and John had his own following, but everything he did was to shine that light toward Jesus. And so as we talk about John this morning, I want you to think about the fact that you guys are headlamps too. And it's also your job to shine a light on Jesus everywhere you go. And I have one really practical way that you can do it. You can probably think of lots of ways how you can shine your light on Jesus during this Christmas season, but here's one way that you can really do this, and that is to invite your friends to come back with you at 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve for our Jingle Jam. Are you excited about Jingle Jam? Raise your hand if you're excited about Jingle Jam. All right, Miss Alice, she's excited. Look, all over there, all the young parents are excited about Jingle Jam. Jingle Jam is going to happen at 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve in our fellowship hall, and it is like vacation Bible school finale on steroids. Is that about right, Miss <laughs> Alice? I mean, it's going to be fun, and we're going to dance and laugh and have a lot of joy, and we're going to jump, and we're going to just have a great time. So you be a light. Invite your friends to come with you. Ask mom and dad if they'll, if they'll offer to pick up you know, some of the neighborhood kids and bring them 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And we can all be like John the baptizer and shine a light on Jesus this season. Sound good? Okay, yeah. I'm going to say a prayer now, and then I'm going to send you off enthusiastically to Children's Church. Would everybody pray with me? Dear God, help us to be a headlamp and shine the light on Jesus. And all together, all of God's children said, amen. Thank you all very much. You may go off to Children's Church. And for the rest of you, the peace of the Lord be with you. Would you please stand now and share signs of peace, hope, reconciliation, and enthusiasm with your neighbor?
seated.
a tremendous blessing to have so much music. If you are here last week, we had our incredible cantata, and now we have the bells, and we are truly, truly blessed as a congregation, uh, especially with the leadership and direction of Natalie Drummond. And I just praise God that we have this ability to express our faith through music. And uh, you all sing pretty good, too. Yeah. What time is choir practice? Wednesday night? All right. Let us now go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this blessing of today. We thank you that you call us to be your church in this incredible high and holy season. And we thank you that in the midst of our waiting time, which is truly what Advent is about, you bring us such blessings of celebration and joy and expression. Father, it is hard to wait. No matter what we're waiting for, it's just hard to wait. When we're pregnant, when we're anticipating a job offer, when we are waiting for medical test results, when we've applied to a college and haven't heard back yet, it's just hard to wait. We are an impatient people, and we are looking all the time for signs of an answer when we're put into the waiting room. So, Father, help us to use this time in the waiting room wisely, that as we wait and anticipate the celebration of your son's birth on earth, the celebration of Emmanuel, God with us, the celebration of God incarnate in the flesh, help us to wait wisely. Help us to wait with our eyes open to see the miracles around us. Help us to wait with our ears open that we might hear the good news spread again and again. Help us to wait with feet that are ready to walk in your steps and to go and tell the good news of your son's birth to people who haven't heard it or don't heed it. Help us in this time of waiting to know that you are always present with us and that waiting times can be useful and used for your purpose. Father, we pray for all those in our congregation and our families and extended families who are ill. We pray that you would come as a source of healing and comfort. We pray for those who are actively dying, that you would be with them, calling them home at your time and giving their family peace and comfort, knowing that while the journey is almost at an end, it is all leading to you. Father, we thank you that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to, to be born and to live and die so that we might never have to die. And we claim that as the best Christmas present we could ever receive. And Father, we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now continue our worshiping of God by the giving of his tithe and our offering.
gracious and loving God, we thank you for every blessing that you have poured out upon us this day and every day. Father, we thank you for these good gifts that have come from heaven above. We pray now that they would go from this place to bless others in your name so that the good news of Jesus Christ would go from here into the world. Amen. Amen. Our scripture for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 11th chapter. I'm going to read verses 2 through 11. Hear the word of the Lord. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. And as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind. What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes. Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal places. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women... No one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Please be seated. This is the third week of Advent. And Advent is a season that is full of longing, full of waiting, full of anticipation, right? So much of what we do in the church and in our traditions is around this idea of of building anticipation and increasing longing as we head towards a Christmas day and the celebration of the Christ child. Does anybody do Advent calendars? In our family, we do these Advent calendars where it's this sort of just test and practice and in patience and waiting that you're only supposed to open one door every single day of Advent. It's like this struggle every morning with our kids. It's like, no, 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 just one door. Like, just, you just get the one treat. There's that temptation to, to eat the entire Advent candle and, I mean, calendar in one sitting. But it's that practice and impatience and, and waiting, right? A wrapped present under a Christmas tree. Again, it builds anticipation, right? An expectation as you look at the wrapped present and wonder what it might be. Maybe you pick it up and, and give it a shake. Maybe you peel a corner or two away, right? Trying to get a glimpse. Right? It's a practice in, in waiting and building and increasing anticipation. Right? The Advent candles. Right? Each week, we light just one as we wait to light the Christ candle there in the center of the wreath. Right? As we celebrate Christmas Eve and, and the birth of Jesus. For some who are liturgically rigid, there's a, a tradition not to sing any of the Christmas carols until it's actually Christmas, right? You guys are lucky that in my old age, I'm weak, right? We've already dove in. Like, we should be on verse stanza 10 of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, right? It should still be sad sounding in here. Only, only minor keys in the Advent songs. There's also the tradition of, of not putting, right, the baby Jesus in the manger until the day of Christmas, right? All of that to build, right, anticipation and, and increase our longing for for Jesus to return, because Advent's that, that funny season of the already but not yet. Like we recognize and celebrate that Jesus has already come, but we look forward for when Christ will come again and put the world to rights, and we long for that time. But it's hard to wait. Right? It's hard to wait. It's hard to wait in the culture. Nobody likes to wait. It's hard to wait in the church. Right? We want those happy songs. We want them now. We want the baby Jesus in the manger. Right? We want them now. We don't want to have to wait and sometimes when we wait, right, our waiting pays off gloriously, and it makes the experience that much better. But other times when we wait, we wait and we wait and we wait only to be let down. Right? Have you ever been let down by a Christmas party or a family celebration? Or maybe you built up the expectation in your mind of, of the way a loved one would react to the present that you got them, only to be let down. Maybe you've been let down by, by that Christmas gift that you were hoping for or longing for. And there's so many Christmases I've, I've waited and waited and waited for the gifts, only to be like a little disappointed. Just didn't, didn't match what I had in my mind. Right? Whether it was that sweater that, that grandma got me, 
I mean, my wife is, she's like the queen of opening presents. You'll never know if she's disappointed. <laughs> she's gonna act so excited, no matter what you get her, she's gonna be just glowing with joy. Where me, you can read it like right away, like he hates what I got him, <laughs> right? Ever had that? I know when I was in fourth grade, the present that I wanted more than any other present was a CD player, right? I just couldn't wait to hear the crisp, just mind-blowing sound of a compact disc. Remember back then where CDs felt like futuristic and like you just thought like they sounded so much better, where nowadays you can't even give a CD away. Nobody wants CDs. Some people probably don't even know what they are or, or what they look like. But back then, that was the present that I just wanted. Wanted above anything else. I just imagined my mind sitting in my room all Christmas Day, hearing this mind-blowing sound of the compact disc. So opened up Christmas present, got it, excited, this little boom box, exactly what I was hoping for. I didn't think through asking for any actual albums, <laughs> but Santa, in Santa's infinite wisdom, had brought me one CD, Billy Joel's River of Dreams, <laughs> right? Now, it wasn't, Billy Joel's great, I love Billy Joel. Love Billy Joel, Piano Man, this wasn't Piano Man, this wasn't Uptown Girl. <laughs> This had one good song, one decent song in the middle of the night. I don't know if anybody even remembers that song. You probably don't because it wasn't that good, the album. So I spent the rest of my Christmas morning just in my room trying to enjoy this Billy Joel album and the sweet sounds of the compact disc, right? But it didn't match what I had in my head. It's complete disappointment. We never had that, that moment where you build it up in your mind and it just doesn't come through. It doesn't You've waited and waited and waited and longed for and longed for and longed for, and it's just not what you thought it would be. Right? The people of God have been waiting, 400 years of waiting. Generation after generation were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for the Messiah to come and to return and to save them, to liberate them, to restore them to what it was like when King David was around. And they had waited and longed for and suffered persecution and oppression. And then Jesus comes on the scene. He's acting like the Messiah, forgiving sins like the Messiah. He's claiming to be the Messiah. Miracles are, are happening, but it's not what most of the people had longed for or prayed for or expected the Messiah to look like. In our scripture this morning, you get the sense that, that even John the Baptist, that, that Jesus surprised even John the Baptist a bit. Because John the Baptist asks that question, Jesus, are you the one to come, or should we wait for another? Now, John the Baptist is one of the constant figures in Advent. Usually, the lectionary gives you two John the Baptist stories. We got lucky because last week was Cantata, because that story was the John the Baptist story where John the Baptist is out in the wilderness, preaching fiery repentance, like, right? turn, repent, prepare the way of the Lord. Remember, people are, are streaming out to the River Jordan to hear John the Baptist preach. He's got the wild hair. He's got the camel's fur on. He's locust honey. And he's out there just dunking people and saying, prepare the way of the Lord. He's calling Pharisees and Sadducees broods of vipers. He's just going to town. His whole mission, as, as Betsy pointed out, was to prepare the way for Jesus. It's to point people to get ready for Jesus. And in this week, we find John the Baptist in a very different place, right? Not out in the wilderness preparing people for Jesus. We find John the Baptist in the middle of a prison cell questioning, Jesus, are you the one to come? Right? John the Baptist, too, was early, right? In the Gospel of John, John the Baptist sees Jesus and says, that is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Like right off the bat, John the Baptist is one of the first ones to recognize Jesus. He was the one who, when he was in his mom's womb, leapt for joy when he got close to Mother Mary, who was bearing Jesus. Right, John the Baptist, too, Jesus came to him and said, I need to be baptized by you. And John rightly recognized, no, Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. Jesus insists. John baptizes Jesus. The, the heavens open, a dove comes down, a voice comes out of heaven and says, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Right, John the Baptist confident that Jesus was the Messiah. We don't hear much from him after that baptism. But then in Matthew chapter 11, we find John the Baptist imprisoned. Maybe life got to him, and now he's questioning. Right after, after all of those early experiences, now John the Baptist himself is even questioning Jesus. Are you the one to come, 
or should we wait for another? And so the disciples go out to ask Jesus that question. Jesus could have answered that question a hundred different ways, but Jesus simply says, tell them what you see. Right, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news. And Jesus' answer is beautiful because he simply just, tell them what you're seeing. And it might not have been what John the Baptist would have hoped for or prayed for or even longed for. You can imagine John the Baptist in that prison cell is thinking, I could use some salvation right about now. <laughs> I could use some, some liberation right about now. But the prophecies were coming true. But I love that question that John asks because it's a very Advent type of question. Jesus, are you the one to come, or should we wait for another? It's a question that I'm willing to bet most of us have asked in this room in some way, shape, or form. It's a question that gives voice to our hesitancy, even in the midst of anticipation. It's a question that allows us to express uncertainty, even on these, this side of the incarnation. Right? It's a question that provides words that maybe our heart and our soul, deep down, have asked. I mean, the culture tells us that this is a season of, of happiness, of peace, right? that this is the season to believe. Right? We talk a lot about belief around this time of year, whether it's belief in Santa, belief in the human spirit, right? belief in Jesus. But John the Baptist reminds us this morning that in a season of waiting, it's okay to doubt. It's okay to wonder. It's okay to question. Right? John the Baptist is, is one of, of numerous saints who have spent a season of their life doubting or questioning or wondering, right? asking that question, Jesus, are you the real thing? Right? Are you the one to come or should we wait for something else? One of my favorite saints who had a season of, of questioning and doubt is Mother Teresa and talked about her before, but Mother Teresa, one of the people in my mind who I think of just exemplifies what it means to follow Jesus. She served the poorest of the poor in, in Calcutta, India, divided, um, gave her entire life to that mission and that ministry. And, and once she passed away, we read some of her journals and her diaries. She went through profound seasons of darkness and doubt and questioning and wondering. I mean, at one point, one of her journals, she writes, Darkness is such that I don't really see. Right, the place of God in my soul is blank. There's no God in me. And when the pain of longing is so great, I just long and long and long for God. The torture and pain I can't explain, she writes. Right, Martin Luther, even, leader of the Protestant Reformation, right, the leader of an entire Christian movement, theologian, right, impacted so many people had a season of, of depression and doubt where he writes, for more than a week, I was close to the gates of death and hell. I trembled in all my members for Christ was lost. I was shaken by desperation and blasphemy of God. I mean, these are the saints of Christ, saints that, that, that we look up to, saints that have shaped the faith in profound ways, yet went through seasons of, of doubt and question and longing. And maybe you've come here this morning and, and you're struggling to get into that Christmas spirit, right, the way that Hallmark tells you that you should. I know that it's okay. It's Advent. And Advent is a season that embraces that all is not as it should be. Right, Advent embraces a longing for our community to be different and better. Advent embraces a longing for our world to be different and better. Advent embraces a longing for our lives to be different and better. Right? Advent em embraces our questions. Because most of us have asked, just as John has asked, Jesus, are you the real thing? Because if you're the real thing, you've got a funny way of proving it. As John asks as he's sitting in a prison cell. Right? Jesus, if you are the one, show me the evidence. Where are the receipts? Because at times when we look at the world, the poor still seem to be exploited, can be pretty violent. There's battles with addiction, disease, cancer, injustice. If, if that's the world I'm looking at, Jesus, what difference do you make? Have you ever asked those questions? 
Have you ever been in a season of your life where, where you had those questions? Because life can be tough. December can be tough. There's no amount of Hallmark movies or lights or decor that can make it all better. I think about John the Baptist, who went from just full-on confidence that that's the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist, who, who baptized Jesus, and the dove, and the heavens opened, and, and the voice went from that to Jesus. Are you the one? Like, have, have I spent too much of my life leading people astray? Do I need to be waiting for somebody else? Was I wrong? And maybe you too have, were once confident in Jesus, right? Faithfully following Jesus with your life. And then life happened. The diagnosis came in. The relationship crumbled. The job was lost. The friend died. And from that place, you wondered, Jesus, are you the real thing? Or should I be looking for something else? And if you've come here this morning and you have those questions, and the answer I've got is the same as Jesus. Is look around. Because as much as Advent's about longing and waiting and anticipation, I think it's also about waiting expectantly with eyes wide open to where heaven is bursting forth in our very midst. It's waiting with, with eyes wide open looking to where the presence of Christ is moving in our midst. And when I look at our community and our world and and at lives expectantly, I see the very presence of Christ among us. You think about in our community, the the past few months, what we've raised over a million dollars for for Ocracoke relief. That's nothing short of a miracle of God. Got to spend half a day last week in the Interfaith Community Outreach Offices, right? And the the little miracles that go forth from there, whether it's keeping a family warm, getting a family back on its feet, right? In that, I see the very presence of God. The little miracles that we send forth from here via our angel tree ministry, right? is a symbol of the very presence of God, of, of heaven breaking forth in our midst. On Friday, I sat in the living room of one of the beloved members of of this church to serve Holy Communion, potentially for one of the last times. And the way that this church has has supported and loved and cared for this family is nothing short of the very presence and grace and love of Jesus Christ. And all of that, I think it's because of Jesus. So this morning, if you've come with doubt, If you're struggling to to feel the Christmas cheer, know that you're in the right place, you're in the right season, yet I would encourage you, as you long for Christ to make his return, as you long for, for Jesus to come back and make the world whole and right again, don't miss out on the miracles that are happening before us. Don't miss out on the, the moments and the places where heaven is breaking forth right before our very eyes. Jesus, are you the one to come or should we wait for another? And Jesus is the one, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the gift of your love. We give you thanks for the promise of life and life everlasting. God, we give you thanks for the first time you came and showed us how to live, died for our sins so that we might know life and life eternal. And God, this morning we long for you to return, to return to make us whole again, to return to make our world whole again. For it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. We invite Logan to rev up a video. I don't know about you, but... December for me is event after event after event, and sometimes it's hard to even um, pause for a moment. So if the video works, I want to play a, a video, and it's, uh, it's going to be an Advent benediction, Advent prayer, sort of an, an Advent blessing. Yep. So if you put it on the screens, I just want you to pause, take a moment before you head to the next thing to enter into sort of the wonder of our season. You heard the cry of our heart. 
going back. Amen. Hopefully having centered yourself for this Advent season, I'm going to invite you to stand and sing a happy song, O Come All Ye Faithful, number 234. Will you stand and sing?
Please be seated. Go forth in peace. May the strength of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.